service this morning. Amen. This morning is gone. Amen. For some people, the day is gone. Right? There are people that went out into eternity today. Probably never thought they would. Never. Probably some ladies never looked in the mirror, curling their hair, thinking I better get ready. I'm meeting the Lord today. But by the end of the day, possibly life gone. Amen. I think it's very important for us to be aware of uh, and, and keep in mind. Some people don't like to think of it. They think it's rather morbid. I think it's very important for us to uh, keep in mind that we're not here forever. Yeah, amen. Let me tell you something, Charlie. Now that I love church, my dad was a preacher, and I wasn't always fond of having to go to church and, you know, one of those what they call drug babies, you know, drug here, drug there. <laughs> Now that I like church, I can spot a church a mile away. <laughs> so when someone says they didn't even know it was a church, if it was a club, if it was a bar, if it was a whatever, you know, if it was a restaurant, whatever, you know, we spot things that we enjoy. And I don't know about you, but um, it doesn't have to have a steeple. I like to see one, but it doesn't have to have one <laughs> um, for me to look. And when I pass, um, it's just one of those things. I just look the countryside over, you know. Churches for places where people have gathered to worship God, and so um, 
we won't feel bad tonight. If, if they didn't know it was the church and it was our fault, we will feel bad. But if they didn't know it was the church because it just wasn't their thing, maybe one day they'll have the time of their life right here in this building uh, and give him the time of their life. In uh, the book of 1 Timothy tonight in chapter 6, I'm going to read to you what um, is my life verse. If you don't have a life verse, it's just a verse in the Word of God that means a lot to you. You can pick it out, you can rehearse it, you can learn it, you can memorize it, and once you know it, if it's something that you feel like just fits you, as uh, Brother Ronnie, um, uh, what do you want me to call you? Ron, Ron Jr., Ronnie, Ron... What do you call me? Uh, R-H? R-2. 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 All right. Well... <laughs> We'll say that. We get a lot of people coming. Those all those Star Wars fanatics keep coming in here. Like, Where's R2 and D2? <laughs> but anyhow, um, he was saying that song was his testimony. Well, that's basically what a life verse is. It is your, it's, it's what you cling to, what you, what you can say, this represents me. I've not always been a great representation of this. Um, and all you have to do is look at a person um, to know that. I, will, I, I try not to be... I don't try to talk about other people. Uh, I can talk about myself. Teresa doesn't always like it. But if I say to you tonight, if someone were to say to me, you must like to eat, and I say, no, I'm just big bone, you probably wouldn't believe that. You'd probably say, you know, I don't care what it says, that boy likes to eat. Um, the same with a life verse. When you have a life verse, probably you quote it enough, you tell people it enough. And people can look at you, and after a while, they'll be able to see if, you, if that holds true in your life, if you stick to that, uh, if that's something, rather, maybe that's stuck with you. Um, Dan Whitty had a brother-in-law, Virgil Eichenlaub, his he and Sharon's son, only son, Virgil David, and his wife Tracy will be here, Lord willing, they'll be here on Wednesday night service. They asked if we were having church, I said, yes, well, the 4th of July is the next night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, some some people shut her down, but we're going to have service, of course, and uh, they're going to come from West Virginia and be in service with us. But he used to tell me all the time, Virgil would say, that Dan would say, that Dave, Dan's dad would say, you stick by the God of the Bible, and the God of the Bible will stick by you, will stand by you. Well, you can tell. Uh, when someone lives their life according to uh, the Word of God or according to uh, the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life and those things. So hopefully tonight you can find a verse in here and make it your own. Just cling to it. It doesn't have to be this one. This is a good one for me, but it's not one that I've always um, lived up to, to the best of my ability. But it helps me. It doesn't shame me. I could live in shame, but the Lord set me free from that, and so I try not to, but I try to look at it um, on a daily basis and trying to judge how I'm doing if I could just take one verse from the Word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul tells Timothy, um, I could read a bunch, you could say, well, this is taken out of context, but it's really not. In verse 6, but godliness with contentment is a great gain. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Verse 8, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Verse 9, then, in context, but they which uh, that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So this is kind of a charge uh, that Timothy, that Paul has given to Timothy here, and as he is speaking to him, he's also given him some warnings. Um, and we sometimes like to uh, we like to look at this, and, and you'll hear people say this often: uh, money is the root of all evil, and it is not the root of all evil, but it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Why do you think there are human trafficking 
situations that go on, and supposedly Ohio is one of the biggest areas for that. Why is that? Well, um, it's for many different reasons probably, but someone's getting some money off of it. Somebody is taking money and uh, being able to uh, bring in money for, for maybe they can't get out and get a job, don't want to, whatever the deal is. Doesn't matter. From the lowest person to the highest person, if you make that your God, you will do anything to seek out how to make more, 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 right. more, more. Exactly. Now, if you've heard me say, and I've mentioned it only once, uh, maybe I think I don't mention it often because um, Teresa probably uh, would uh, get on to me on the way home if I did. And we did drive together tonight, whereas we were separate this morning. And I would have to hear it all the way home. But um, I um, have ran across the fellow that I listen to on the radio. If he's on a couple hours a day and I'm in service area, I'll listen to him a couple hours a day. And I find myself sometimes going on YouTube to listen to him. And he is a financial advisor, but he's a Christian. But I like other things he says because they are so simple. Now, if you lived with us for 32 of the 33 years that we've been married, you would find that I did not live by the principles that he is teaching. I wished I would have. I would have been probably an everyday millionaire by now, but I didn't. And um, there's a reason uh, for that. I wasn't always content. Now, I could say that I was contented with the things that God blessed me with, but if I am truly contented... Why would I continue to seek, to seek, to seek, to search for other things? Yeah. And so my life verse is, but God has <laughs> with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6, 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If I can be content, if I can be content with the things that I have, if I can... Um, if I find myself not content with what I have, I start doing what? Seeking for something else. And it happens in every walk of life and everything you may do. You find that uh, from, uh, from one of the biggest decisions you will ever make in your life, to marriage, to right on down to what car you have, to what house you have, to all those things. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with some of that stuff, but if it is that there is something inside of us that we cannot feel that void, then maybe we need to take a closer look. Now, this is one minister teaching a young minister how to conduct himself because he is going to be in charge of churches. If you read anything or understand about the Apostle Paul, he was not one of them guys that came and dropped his anchor and stayed somewhere a long time. He knew uh, that somewhere, because of what he preached and the life that he had lived before, I believe that he knew that there was a day coming where he was going to lay his life down. And so he continually would teach and would train and would give instruction to people yeah. of the church, of the faith, of the early church, so they could grow. Yeah. And, you know, I look at this congregation tonight. I don't suppose any of you in here tonight are not Christians. I suppose that you all are Christians. So if we came to this service and for uh, three or four months in a row, everybody here was a Christian and all you heard me preach was you must be born again, it'd probably get kind of old. So what is the Apostle Paul's mission? It's not only to see people saved, but it is to give instruction to the early church. And God knew that this word would be given to us today. And so that instruction lives on. It's what God wanted us to know. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, I can say I'm content, but if I'm not godly, that doesn't mean much. Or I can say I'm godly, but if I'm not content, that might not mean much. But these two together is great gain. Why? Because I don't have to ch keep chasing after the things of the world to make myself Amen. happy. Yeah. No. You find uh, one of the nurses that I worked with in South Carolina, and if she sees this, she'll say, don't talk about me, but I won't share her name. <laughs> she, she sent some pictures the other day um, and put them up, posted them to her site, said, this is my midlife crisis. And she bought a vehicle, and, you know, I'm looking at it. I think, well, that's a pretty nice vehicle. But she said, I had to get out of the mommy vehicle, and this is my midlife crisis. And I thought of how many men that I have known through the years. Nothing wrong with uh, motorcycles, Rich. Nothing wrong with boats. <laughs> nothing wrong with guitars, all those things. But how many... People have you seen trying to fill a void because there is something lacking that they just don't have. You know, I mean, there's a, have you ever sat down to eat a great meal, something good, and once you're done and you're full, you don't want anything else. And you say, that just didn't, that wasn't really what I wanted. 
Yeah. I mean, how many people in in the, the United States alone are hungry tonight? And and you're saying that wasn't really what I wanted. And you could go right to a restaurant, buy something else, go to Kroger's, or go to your kitchen and get something else. And and if you aren't so full, maybe you'd even attempt to try that just to satisfy the hunger that you had. Well, there are That's people that are doing that every day spiritually. They don't yeah. know yeah. what it is they want. And there are people that have been in the church, some of them for years, and they don't know. Right. And they look, um, and there's a difference. That's why there are differences, a lot of differences in different restaurants. People say, why are there so many different denominations? And I say, why are there so many different restaurants? Not every, Everybody may like a hamburger, but they don't all like Wendy's. Some like McDonald's, some like Burger King, whatever. And that, that makes it, breaks it down. It makes it simple for me to understand because I'm a hamburger guy. I can get that. I can understand that. Some people, their music is this taste, some is this taste, some is this taste. They all want to serve God, but they, maybe they do it in a different way. I don't really have a problem with that. I figure, uh, I, you know, you can always go and tell which one is most like because you will usually see them of uh, the most full on a Sunday, especially if you leave here and try to go get something to eat. But people are trying to feel what they are hungry for. They're trying to feel that emptiness. And even people who have been Christians for years, if they're not careful, Satan will come and he will snag them. Now, I know this being a free will Baptist church built on a free will Baptist, the constitution of the church would have been either long run or either a charity. Um, that doctrine is that, yes, you can have a relationship with the Lord, and somewhere along the line you'll walk away from that. Well, how many folks do you know yourself that have done that? That were on fire for God at one time, but now they're not. And you don't see them any longer serving God the way they used to because something happened. And, and uh, you don't go and try to criticize them, but all you can do is pray for them. Somewhere along the line, something happened, and the desire for working for God maybe isn't being fulfilled in their life like it once was. And then somebody said to me one time, you know, I think it's a shame you find a church where people used to shout and the same people are going there. They haven't died yet. They're still going there, but they don't shout any longer. Yeah. And I could say I can see that man's point, because, but that man doesn't know some of the things that you may go through in your life. It's easy sometimes to shout and praise God when you're on the mountain. But, folks, I don't know too many people that can stand the altitude to live on the mountaintop oh, all the time. And so yeah. sometimes... You're not on the mountain. And I'm kind of leery when I find someone who is such a live wire that I can barely stand to be around them. They're like Moses with the light shining from his face. They're so godly. They're almost, as I said last week, a spiritual superman. I kind of wonder what it is. Maybe they are plugged in and they got a lot more than me. But sometimes I think, man, someday you're going to crash, fella. Yeah. And when you do, the same God that carries the people that go up and down, I'm not talking about their relationship with God. It may be rock solid. Yeah. But sometimes life has ups and downs. Yeah. And you and I, the general population of the church, may get this feeling that if we're not jumping and hooping and hollering and running the backs of the pews, that we don't have anything. And that's wrong. When someone says, if you don't feel that, there's something wrong with you. You need to pray. I'm thinking, wait a minute. I've seen a lot of people and heard a lot of emotionalism from people that I didn't feel anything, and it may happen to me. But I also can bank that sometimes it was because what they were feeling didn't have anything to do with me. Amen. Maybe they weren't feeling something I needed. I would advise young Christians, don't ever pray, God, make me like Ron or make Amen. me like George or make me like... Charlie or God make me like any of And you know, you watch a young preacher mold. This happens when preachers come and they idolize someone who does a great job and they can't find their place in life yet. It's almost, I used the illustration this morning about football teams and coaches and, you know, everybody's looking, whether you like him or not, everybody's looking for the next Tom Brady to come out. Man, he's going to win Super Bowls. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. And everybody's got to fit into that mold. And when they go scouting, they start looking for someone like that. Well, that's how it is a lot of times with preachers. And preachers and churches put a lot of stress on themselves sometimes, trying to be something they are not. Amen. Or someone they are not. And the world doesn't need 50 million Billy Grahams. No. The world needs 50 million men and women that will go out and tell about the Lord. Yeah, we don't all have to do it in the same way. No. 
But Satan comes and says to you sometimes, well, you just don't have it. You, sometimes if you're not careful, you'll find yourself not even being content with the relationship you have with God. Now, I won't tell you to be safe there. What I will tell you is if you're not content with your church, if you're not content, if you had said to me tonight, I'm not really content with your preaching, I would say, well, okay, I understand. <laughs> How about your relationship with God? If you are content with it, if you have godliness, if you are walking close to the Lord, you will know where just about every church is coming and going down the road. You will know uh, gospel music when you hear it different from any other music. You will just know. You will feel something different because there will be a relationship, not just a religion any longer, but a relationship that you have with the Lord. That's the great thing about it. I mean, you know, I could say me and Teresa have dated for 32 years, but we're married. So it's more than dating. There is a relationship there that some people claim that they get from dating. Do your thing, I guess. But uh, I like being married to her. That's and, you know, even in our Sunday school or in our Bible school, uh, one of the kids, uh, Teresa said, I overheard one of the kids saying, my Sunday school or my Bible school teacher is the pastor's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> said, what a way to get a rumor started. <laughs> but she was the teacher, of course. Yeah. And so this little child was looking and seeing Teresa, and Teresa said something about me, and that's, of course, the first thing they said. You know, little kid's mine. I have a good relationship with her. I love her. I come home to her every day. I talk with her. We eat together. Well, I tell you, we eat at the kitchen table. No. You know why? We don't have a kitchen table. We live in a house so small, you don't even have room for a kitchen table. But we eat together. We talk together. We walk together. We still hold hands. She says she can't sing. She lies. She can't. She can't. Sometimes we sing together. We drive together when we go on vacation always. It's not just a ritual, but it's just something I... I feel it's safe to do for one thing, but it's just when we will get in the car and make sure everything's packed up, everything we got ready to go, we will strap our seat belts, start the car, and she will either say the prayer or I will say the prayer. But we pray together before we go on uh, trips. We probably should do it just coming over here tonight, but we do it driving 10 hours or whatever. We, we love one another, and there's a relationship there. There's contentment there because of that close relationship. But if I get out of relationship with her, and we still live in the same house, and I walk in and like, are you kidding me? You don't have any of my socks clean? <laughs> I'm not even going to look at you, man, because maybe you'll get red-faced on that. Maybe that's you. I don't know. Are you kidding me? Have I ever done that, baby? Sure I have. I'm like, come on, baby. I work five days a week, and then I live two more days other than that. i got to have a very clean sock. And sometimes she says, wash them yourself if you want them, right? I've been busy, too. But that doesn't break the relationship. What am I saying tonight? When you attend church with other people, there's always a chance that something can happen that, oh my goodness, I, I don't know if I can go there any longer. Yeah. You've been there, I've been there. It's a hard thing to leave a church. Yeah. It is. If you, really, if you really love God, now, now if, if there's something that happens real terrible, it may be easy. But if you really want to be what Jesus represents in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We all know what the troublemakers are called. We know who they're working for. But we are peacemakers, and that's what we want to be. And so when you feel like, I just don't know how much more I can handle of that, I would say first stop and see where is your relationship with God. I would like to see the church fill up. All these pews fill up. I would. And I'm going to tell you something. If it was other churches and people were leaving saying, oh, that didn't really have it going on there. i got to find a place to go. But if you're going to come here and help it get going on, then come on. But if you're going to come here and look and say, ah, they ain't no good over there either. <laughs> then I would say, look in yourself. Yeah. Look at the word of God and see, Amen. is it that I am not content with what God has blessed me with? Amen. Do you think I've changed over the years? Man, I could show you. If we had the big screen, we could put pictures of me and Trace up there. And you could 
you could see us. Man, I had the mullet. I had the big old high hair. Teresa and I had the same hair that someone pointed out one day when we, were, when we were teenagers. We both graduated the same year, so we're the same age. Well, I'm, I'm exactly a month older than she is. Um, but you could look at me. You could look at her. Do you think we've changed since we've dated and been married for 30-some years? Absolutely. Absolutely. And even in our spiritual Maturity, walking with the Lord, being a pastor and a pastor's wife, and then just attending church and looking for churches and, and Sunday school teaching, doing whatever it was that we did in other churches. There were times that we would find ourselves not content, and that said to us, it is time to be somewhere. I appreciated Ron this morning. I listened to uh, his prayer again as I listened to the recording of this morning. I heard him or his heart this morning as he said, pray for me because I just, I'm a servant and I want to be found doing what God wants me to do. That should be the desire of everybody. Amen. There's enough work in a church for anybody that wants to yeah. work. You know, yeah. just keep coming and keep doing it. So if you got, you say we got too many singers, then we'll sing in shifts. Uh, you know, we'll have these people sing this day, these people sing that day. There's too much this, there's too much that. Well, we'll make room for it. Amen. But sometimes, if you're not careful, Satan will wiggle it around where you're just, you are not content with anything. And the next thing I know, you will be able to, man, I did not expect this message to go this way. <laughs> okay. Next thing I know, you will be the squeaky wheel. <clears throat> Next thing I know, I will be the maintenance man. And I will be following after you all the time, trying to put out fires, trying to help you, trying to do I want you to grow? Absolutely. Amen. But sometimes we just got to grow. Yes, I want us to grow together. I want us to be strong. I want us, we can pick the we can pick the church apart. It didn't take, you know, we didn't come here, what, three times we came in here. I started looking, man, they could do this, they could do this. There's a few things that I would like to see done physically to the church. I mentioned this morning, but those things could also split the church. So I'll leave those things for a little while, and we'll see how well you like us, I guess. But then, that's a joke, maybe. <laughs> but then, but then there are other things I looked at, and I thought, these people, they do have it going on. They are doing, they are playing the part, they're filling the roles, they're doing whatever they can do to keep the church rolling as it should. God, these people need more workers. They need people to come in in one mind, one accord, be on fire, ready to come to church. If the church starts at 6 o'clock, not be like at home at, at 5 after 6, say, oh man, I just don't have strength to put my shoes on. I got to go to church again tonight. No, you don't have to go. I like to see people that say, man, like at 4.30. Man, I can't wait. Let's get ready and go to church. Amen, glory. And when we love one another, and I know I mentioned that a lot, but you can't find contentment with the people you worship with and love if you don't have it within yourself, but when you are contented with your walk with God, you will love people. Sure. We're not all alike. Right. No. We aren't all alike no. to a certain extent. But then if you would cut us, we bleed the same. Yeah. If you would ask, some of you have been through the same hurts and the same joys in your life that I have been through, but you've been through totally different things. The two fellows here, uh, no doubt, been in battle, been in conflict, been in war. And although they were both in war, they probably still see things a little different because of where they were and what they saw. Yeah. We may not all see it the same. Right. I like the Reds. We could go to a Reds ball game, and you could be in center field, and I could be at home plate, and you could see the same play that I see. You could see it different. It's the same play. Sure. You can see it different because you have a different perspective and point of view than what I see it, but we both see the same thing. Sometimes when we lose contentment in our hearts, we lose contentment for anything around us. Amen. And the next thing you know, we find it hard. We are the one that is hard to get along with. I had a person say to me one time, and I pastored this person for years, and I loved them and still love them. There was a point they started coming to me and they found a problem with everything in the church. It didn't matter what it was. It was a problem. And so I'm thinking, 
You know, this is where if God would have blessed me to be an evangelist, I could have went out, you know, evangelized and took off to the next town. But I'm a pastor, so <laughs> what do I have to do? I have to see her the next time she comes in the door complaining about the next thing she complains about. And I said to her one day, I am afraid that what is happening with you is you are not happy inside any longer. It has nothing to do with the people that there are too many kids at the church and they put paper in the, in the backs of the pew. Okay, that's something to complain about. But if you're the janitor, clean it up. I mean, you know, big deal. If you don't have kids, you'll find old people doing it. You may find a set of ditchers in it. I don't know. But whatever. There's always going to be something. That if you want to be a complainer, you will be a complainer. But we don't need more complainers, right? No. No, we don't. We need more people saying, man, that's great. Get up there and do your thing. Look at someone, and maybe they do the same thing in the church that you do, but to be able to look at them and say, you go. You know, you do it. You be successful. You be who you are for God. We're talking in the back, man. Uh, when the church starts to grow and when people get off this idea that it's uh, only important to bring your family to Sunday morning service and if they ever get back to coming back on what almost seems to be a uh, uh, a, a downward trend for the church on even Sunday night. Somebody could say, well, we're playing ball. And you may be, I don't know. But somewhere, when the church starts growing, you have to have contented, happy, hearted Christians Amen. ready to take these kids to the classes, ready to work with them, ready to start a little, you know, get them kids up here in the morning in front of the congregation. Get them used to, don't beg them when they're 15 or 20 to be in the choir. Amen. If you don't sing Jesus Loves Me with them when they're little, teach Amen. them from the ground up. Right. And it's not always done at home, so let's do it in the church. Amen. When we are content in our hearts, when we are content with the relationship we have with God, we will want to strive to see everybody else do great for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Godliness with contentment is a great game, but we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. So what are you taking on? Nothing. 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 Teresa and I had the same hair, did and we weigh less than what we do now. And, and it's especially me. <laughs> yep. Those things changed. One day, older, some of you folks, if I live to be, okay, I'm 51 now. Some of you, if I live to be your age, you will be with the Lord maybe already, right? Amen. And so, I'm not putting you down, I'm just saying this is the way that we go. This is this is what nature teaches us, the Word of God teaches us, the life in general teaches us. And so, one day, if I am, some people say blessed or not blessed, to be somewhere and someone waiting on me hand and foot, other than my wife, someone in a facility taking care of me. Maybe I can't do things for myself and someone's in there taking care of me. If I can just say, have you heard about Jesus today? Do you know how, how uh, moving it is to go into a facility and sing to people who do not want to be there? Sometimes they feel as if uh, they'd rather be anywhere but there. But they still tell you how much they love God. They're still content in their heart. They have a relationship with their Heavenly Father. And I hope tonight that you are content. Um, not to, if you need to move up closer to God, then get there. Don't be content just being where you are. Right. Be there. Charlie asks for testimonies, and he does that sometimes. Uh, some people say, well, isn't there a certain time to ask for testimonies? Yeah, when you hear it coming out of his mouth. Yeah. Uh, he's the one leading the service, so if he says, let's do it between the offering, then you know what? That's time. Yeah. For you then to be, you know what? I'm happy in the Lord. I thank God for what he did for me. And then just get up and just bow to that. And if it gets too many, and if there's 40 people that want to testify for 35 minutes apiece, we'll learn to say, okay, let's, let's, don't, let's don't do that tonight, right? But, but when you've given the opportunity to publicly express, some people aren't public people. 
Somebody said to me one time, uh, a man left the church and never came back because someone asked him to close in prayer. And he just was not an open praying person in, in prayer. And so he left and he never went back. And he never went back to church, period. And I'm like, God, help me to know which one of these guys in here that I'm going to offend. And I already feel like I've probably asked some of the people that I might think twice about the next time, but I've already asked them. If you don't want me to ask you, just come to me and say, Brother George, please don't call on me to pray. Yeah. Don't tell me because you can't do it. Because I say, what, you don't talk to your wife? That's all we're doing is talking to God. Yes, he's holier than your wife, but still, he's our Heavenly Father. But if you don't want to do it, just come to me and tell me. Don't let something like that be what the last straw that breaks the camel's back. I'm never going to church again until someone asks me to pray. I would say there might be something wrong in here in that situation. Are you content tonight in your relationship with God? Do you want more? Do you want to just be religious? Maybe, maybe do, you, do you want to just go to church? You know, you can get on a program. And I know without a pastor, it's real easy to get on a program. I told Teresa, we took, look, you're already trained. Look, now let me see if you do this. Look, now what? <laughs> for, all you, <laughs> for all you people, like, he's done. He shut the Bible. Whoa, wait a minute. Now what? <laughs> What did he say? I told Teresa, I said, you know, when you get there and the church starts growing and it really starts rolling, this um, um, starting at 6 and being out by 7, let's get a nice cream, let's be down at the restaurant by 11 o'clock on Sunday. It's probably going to change. Amen. What happens then? Someone won't like it. They'll find another church that's dead and go to right. <laughs> like, there ain't nothing happening there. Let's go there so we can get to the restaurant. Yeah. If we want to eat that bad, we'll have meals here every week, right? But I understand we like to do it too. But what I like to see is the people that say, you know what, if we're in, now don't drag the church service out just for Brother George wants a long church service. Oh, here we go. <laughs> no, I get the brunt of it because I get up to preach. I know who's sleeping and who's not. Who, when you shut your eyes, you got eyeballs painted on your eyelids. I know. I can tell. I can tell when God says to shut it down. But folks, if the Lord's blessing us and we start at 930, and the church is rolling. Let me say to you, let the church roll on because that's the way you start having a church. You can't be sad like Brother Charlie says. We are not on this routine of you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do that. Yes, we can do those things. But in the process of that, let's don't push God out of the way. Maybe one of these times you're going to get enough nerve up to come up here and say, I don't do this very often. Maybe from your pew, you're going to just stand up and just belt out the most beautiful song. Yeah. And revival will break out. Yeah. Why? Because you did what you should have done. Amen. Versus us coming in saying, hey, well, you know, <laughs> we got to get the Portsmouth, the Wheeler, virtually the best restaurant, so we better cut it short. Yeah. We don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. We want to be content, and the contentment grows we are excited about the work of God, and when we are, we want the church to go. Do I want the church to explode so when I go out in the community, people say, I'm hearing all the good things about you. You know what I want to say when someone says that? Keep listening. Because you will hear some things that you will say, wow. <laughs> you want that. I don't like Charlie getting up here all the time saying, we got a good pastor. And he's like, okay, Charlie, I'm a good pastor. Stop. <laughs> That's it. No more. No more, Charlie. Don't get up here and tell how bad I am, but you know why? Because I just think to myself, oh, people don't want to hear that. They maybe think George thinks he's somebody. Look at me. I told you when I came, I have the heart of a pastor. You have the best, not knocking anybody, but the best pastor's wife you could ever have. Amen. And I'm all right. <laughs> I'm not too bad at trying to do what I do. I'm not the greatest. Man, I love you people, and I want you to love me, and I want us to love God. And when we do, and we're content with the love that God has given us, we won't look for everything else. To right. maybe if we can find this church that will make us feel this way. If you want a feeling, you can find a feeling on every street corner. You can find a feeling in another church. But is that what God wants for you, or is this it? I need to be here. Let's root this thing and Bless go with it. Amen. Let's see yeah. this place grow. If you're watching this live... And you say, well, man, I need a church where I can do something. Come on. I'm not going to hand you the reins and let you take over everything. But if you want to work, we will work it to where we can work. What do we need? We need Amen. We need your money, right? <laughs> we need a church van. We need some things happening to where it can roll, folks, 
sin, and if they can't be driving themselves because they're six and seven and eight years old, we need some way to get them here. We need a lot of things. When we have contentment in a relationship with God, we want those things for God, for the kingdom, not for George, not for charity, but for the kingdom. These are kingdom people around us. They're going to die and go to heaven or hell. And let's don't let it be hell because of us. Let's be content with what God's done in our hearts and let's say you need what we have. Don't be boastful and say, man, you ought to be like me. The Apostle Paul did say that, right? Say, yes, George, I know, but you're, you can shut it down if you want. But yes, George, I know, but you're not the Apostle Paul. You're right. So I strive to be like Christ, not like the Apostle right. Paul. Right. I try to be as close as I can. Am I a failure? Yes, but if I use that every time, Lord, I'll never be. I'll never be the best singer in the world, but does it stop me from singing? No. I'll never be a fantastic guitar player. Does it stop me from having 11 of them? No. <laughs> I just do what I do. I try to do my best. I'm going to close with this. When a fellow asked me, a good friend of mine asked me one time, he said, when you go into a rest home and sing, do you sing different in the church than you do in rest home? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I mean, do you like because it's people in rest home versus... I said, oh, you mean sing different in a church as a part of a show thing. And he said, well, I mean, I'm just asking you, do you sing different? And I said, I try with all my heart to sing for an audience of one. He sits on a throne in heaven. I'm trying to sing the best that I can sing, no matter what it sounds like. If my voice cracks, that's the best I can do that day. Whatever it is, I try to do the best I can do for him. Yeah. Amen. And that's what I ask of you tonight. Do the best you can do for the Lord. Be content in the relationship that you have. Godliness with contentment is great gain. If you're contented in a relationship you have with God, that's fantastic. If you're not, move up a little closer. Not on these pews. That's all right if you want to, but move up in your heart closer to God. Yeah. Stand with me, if you will, as we give an invitation. Maybe you're here tonight and you want to move closer to the Lord. Maybe you want to draw closer to Him. Somebody said to me here a while back that they were with someone in a vehicle. They knew the person's life wasn't being lived in a manner that the Word of God says, not just what that person thought, but the Word of God says. And said there was a song came on, I Surrender All, and the person sang right along with it. And he said to me, George, how can they do that? They're singing words to a song, and they're not meaning it from their life. That Red back hymnal that we got that songbook can make a liar out of you if you're not careful. You sing I Surrender All, and you don't mean it with your whole heart, then what are you doing? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You could look through here and find all kinds of things. Well, these are songs, George, that we only sing when we feel good. Well, no wonder we don't have many people in the choir then, right? <laughs> but, but, but Brother George, how close are you to God? You want to get closer to God? Or are you content being where you are? As if you are, and where you are is good with you and God, then fantastic. But if you're not, man, if you can't get on your knees, sit on the altar. Let's pray. Have a talk with God. Do it at home. Just get closer. Don't just settle. Don't just settle. It would be heartbreaking if Teresa said to me one day, you know, after 30 years of marriage, I want you to know I just settled for you. Could have had better. <laughs> What are you saying to God? If you don't give him everything you got, are you saying to God, I just settled? Don't just settle. Give him everything. Yeah. Everything. As she plays tonight, if you're here with the need, would you come let us pray for you?
They were looking to give you praise and honor and glory for what you've done. I know they didn't have to even open their mouth to do that, God. I'm not that judgmental to say because they didn't say a word, they didn't worship you. I don't believe that. I believe that even worshiping is done through the Spirit that resides in us that you've given us. And so, God, even if they didn't say a word with their mouth, when they came tonight to worship you, they came for the right reason. God, I pray they got what they wanted when they came. God, I pray that although this congregation may be full of people that have a relationship with you, if it's not as close to you as it needs to be, God, help them to see that. Help them to understand that it's not the pastor's job to judge them. It's not anybody else's job to look at them and say they need to be closer, but that's what the preaching of the Word of God does. It instructs us. It leads us. It guides us. It helps us to draw closer. It helps us to have a better and a closer relationship with you. God, that relationship shines in this community and beyond. We don't just service Scioto County. We don't just service Clark Town and Memphis and Lucasville. But God, wherever it is that we go, we are an ambassador, a representative of Jesus Christ. Help us to be content in knowing that you love us and that we love you and we love those people that are around us. God, help us to reach them for the kingdom's sake. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.